Blog Talk Radio. Welcome again to Subversive Radio. I am your host, Keith Giles, and I'm very excited to uh, have my special guest on this program. Last week, we had part one of a show with uh, John Zenz, who's a good friend and also the author uh, of several books, um, one of which we're going to be talking about tonight, What's With Paul and Women. Uh, in part one, which you can also listen to in the archives here on Log Talk Radio at Subversive Radio, um, we got into the passage in First Timothy, uh, chapter two, verses uh, nine through fifteen. We didn't get to finish, and so we, uh, John was uh, nice enough to decide to come on back and let us finish up the topic. And so uh, we want to do that, and then also see if we can uh, dive into First Corinthians fourteen as well, uh, and kind of wrap up this topic this evening. So, John, uh, thank you so much for being my guest this evening. Uh, good to be with you, and look forward to our conversation. Yeah. And uh, hopefully we won't have any uh, technical difficulties, but um, you know, well, hey, you want to? We'll, we'll just get through it if we can. Uh, right. I also want to just, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, and thank you for being a good sport about that. I appreciate it. Um, so yeah, John, we uh, we got we we uh, got fairly into the First Timothy passage um, last Sunday evening, and um, we didn't get. I know you were. I had to cut you off. We're running out of time. Where you were just about to get into. Uh, I think probably one of the, uh, you know, it's a difficult passage already, but uh, it sort of ends with a real head scratcher there, um, <laughs> where Paul says something a little inexplicable. Kind of, I think it starts in, in 13 where he talks about for Adam was formed first and Eve, and Adam was not the one deceived; it was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But women, he says in verse 15, will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with propriety and. Uh, and uh, what is he talking about there, John? What's what's going on there? <laughs> right. Well, as I uh, uh, briefly went over last week, when you when you begin to see the flow there, uh, in light of the uh, the uh, Artemis culture that dominated the Ephesian landscape, um, you know things begin to fall into place. And um, uh, I mentioned that the Paul has, you know, plural men, plural women, and then singular woman. I am not now allowing a woman. So that's a question that needs to be faced. Why does he move from the plural to the singular? And then we talked about the uh, the word translated silence in some versions is incorrect. It should be uh, quietness, which is the same word used in verse 2, that we're to live a quiet Life, which is uh, an interesting fact that some people like me, I used to associate quietness with uh, being a female, but actually being quiet in quietness is a is a trait that is to be a mark of all believers, male and and female. So that's certainly a, an important point that gets missed. And then we went into the strange word that Paul uses, authentain, uh, which is translated as. Uh, not have authority over a man, but we looked at how that's not really a a very fair uh, look at the word. And then we went into Adam being created first, and why Paul would say that in an Artemis-saturated culture where women were created first, uh, or a woman was created first in the Artemis myth. And uh, so naturally, Paul would be correcting their their, uh, female-centered Religion, and so he's just pointing out the historical fact uh, that Adam was created first, and uh, and then he talks about the woman being deceived, and then he moves into this esoteric statement about women being saved in childbirth, and as you mentioned, uh, well, that's one of the most uh, enigmatic scriptures in the New Testament. I mean, there's been like you know 129 different interpretations of that verse and what it means and indeed it causes you to scratch your head 
<laughs> but I really yeah. do think that once you begin to see the Artemis background, then the verse makes total, absolutely total sense. Because yeah. in the culture of Ephesus, where Timothy was staying to help the the uh, problems, um, uh, Artemis was the the goddess that was called upon by the women, the non-Jewish women, um, for help in uh, pregnancy and uh, childbirth, especially childbirth. Artemis was not so much a fertility goddess. She was just more of a goddess that was called upon once a woman was pregnant and then uh, pleading for her help in the uh, the uh, the act of childbirth, which, of course, in the first century was a very, you know, a dangerous thing because you could lose baby or baby and mother, you know, many times in, in mm -hmm. just the uh, giving of, of birth. So the, here's the crucial point, which I alluded to last week a little bit, was how did the women approach Artemis for help in times of pregnancy and childbirth, it was through their prayers that they offered, not by sacrificing animals, but by braiding their hair and curling it in locks and putting jewelry on the top of their head. And that's how these women would come into the presence of Artemis and offer their prayers for safety in childbirth. And uh, there's one inscription in Ephesus that was discovered that had something about um, her prayers were carried in her locks. So in other words, it was, it was the fancy hairdo that was the means of, you might say, gaining Artemis's favor in times of pregnancy and childbirth. So once you see that, then Paul's statement begins to make some sense. Because now he's telling Christian women that they don't need to, you know, go to Artemis with braided hair and fancy curly locks, but rather they can come to the Lord and trust him in childbirth, which makes yeah. total sense. So yeah. that to me is, a, is an unlocking of that strange scripture that, that makes total sense once you put it in the context of an Artemis-saturated uh, culture and many of the sisters in the Ephesian church would have would have come out of that cult because that was of course the dominant uh, feature on the landscape in that city. So anyway, the Artemis Temple, you know, being one of the seven wonders of the world. I mean, this was a huge thing as I likened it to to the presence of Mormonism in Salt Lake City. It would be along that that line. So. Anyway, that, that, that to me opens up that scripture, but, mm -hmm. but, you, but once you see it with that Artemis background and how Artemis was central in the prayers of women, Gentile women, for uh, childbirth and pregnancy, then Paul's statement really begins to make some sense. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, you know, as you were explaining that, I was looking up here in uh, 1 Timothy 2, uh, going back to verse 9, and it, it really wraps the whole thing together uh, when Paul says, I also want women to dress modestly with decency and propriety, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or expensive clothing, but with good deeds appropriate for women who profess to worship God. And, and in contrast, uh, as opposed to women who profess to worship Artemis. Right. Uh, and he specifically points out the way they dress and what they put in their hair and the way they braid their hair. And, and again, having that missing piece of the puzzle, because, you know, we don't live in Ephesus right now, and uh, and so Paul didn't bother to explain stuff that he knew that Timothy would, would instinctually understand, but right. we've missed it. And so because we don't have that understanding, we just read this, you know, we just gloss over it like, oh, I guess Paul just doesn't like women to dress up. Okay. Right. But that's not right. what he's saying at all. He's saying don't follow the ways of Artemis. Follow, follow you know, be like a woman who professes to worship God. Right. Um, and, and that's so the, why. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's. It uh, it just helps understand why these things are being said, and and they become more uh, intelligible and meaningful once you see the the uh, fact that that many women would be coming out of this cult and would have be a, would have, would have been impacted uh, by that cult. So naturally, Paul has to correct some things about the way they dress because you know they could be very easily immodest and, and a little. Uh, you know, a little suggestive in the way they dress and stuff like that. So that would just be part of, of these women 
leaving that cult and then and then growing in Christ and and that as we mentioned last week that one woman or maybe several women were were uh, being a little pushy with their their uh, teaching and and Paul is saying you know I'm not I, you you ladies need to or lady you know you need to learn for a while in quietness and, and just you know be more in a a posture of receiving rather right. than giving and of course so to take that as a universal prohibition against women teaching in any circumstances in any culture you know is missing the the point and then as you know some denominations like the nazarenes will use that the other verse 9 as a prohibition for women to wear jewelry or lipstick or anything like that and that's totally missing the point of why right. paul is saying that he's not saying that a woman can't wear a string of pearls around her neck if she wants to, or pretty earrings. He's just saying that these women coming out of Artemis who offered their prayers with their hair and their curly locks, that that was no longer appropriate and they didn't need to yeah. do that. And it wasn't wrong for them to have curly locks. It's just that they no. shouldn't use those things, you know, as a means to get the favor of the gods. They didn't have to do that anymore. They just could come directly to Jesus Christ and 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 uh, he's the as Paul mentioned earlier in this chapter, he's the one mediator between God and humans, and we we come to him uh, directly, and he he's our savior. Yeah, Amen. No, and, and that is so helpful, John. And I I'm so thankful to you for for explaining that. Your book is uh, it's been such a blessing to me. Um, and and I know and we're going to mention it again at the end of the show, but. For anyone listening right now, I would just remind you, you know, you can pick up this book. It's a it's a quick read, but, you know, it's a, it's a powerful book. And I've lent it out so many times to so many people and had so many people tell me they're so they, – they love it. And then they end up buying copies and sending them to, to friends and family members. Uh, it's a very great book. And you can pick that book up at John's website, which is just his name, J-O-N-J-O-N-Z-E-N-S So J-O-N-Z-E-N-S.com. Uh, and while we got a little bit of time left, can we also jump over to 1 Corinthians 14? Uh, that's right. sort of the uh, the one-two punch of the, the, the <laughs> scriptures that are often used to right. uh, kind of put women down. And and I'm just going to read it quickly uh, for the sake of time here in 1 Corinthians right. 14 in the second half of um, verse 33. It says, as in all the congregations of the saints, women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission, as the law says. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home, for it, it is a disgrace or it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, wow, well, that just seems so powerful. <laughs> Let's just, right. it's over. Yeah, so, it came over, right? <laughs> right. So, yeah, it's, a, it's obviously a big topic, but we can, I think we can summarize it quickly. Um, one thing, we, of course, in, in interpreting Scripture is that you always have to look at the context. So what would be the flow of Paul's thought going back to, say, chapter 11, where he says when any woman prays or prophesies, and he talks about the men praying and prophesying and the woman praying and prophesying. Mm -hmm. And, of course, in that mm -hmm. chapter, I believe it's, he's referring to the husband-wife relationship. He's not talking about single uh, women or widows. He's talking mm -hmm. about uh, husbands and wives. <clears throat> and so there he approbates women praying and prophesying. He has no problem with women praying, praying and prophesying. And in my research, since, uh, you know, really since 19, uh, uh, oh, going back even 1970, because I did some research in 1 Corinthians way back then, but, but I, I have, I have, I, I could be wrong, but I'm, in my research, I have yet to find a commentator who suggests that 1 Corinthians 11 is not a Christian meeting of brothers and sisters. Even Calvin right. says that. All these people seem to agree that it's a gathering of the saints that, that Paul mm -hmm. has in view. Now, they may deny that later when they come to the problem verses you read, but, <laughs> but when they deal with 1 Corinthians 11, they affirm that it is, as they call it, a worship service. So yep. that's interesting because, you know, that's the whole issue. If it is not a gathering of brothers and sisters, then where would it be? Where would a woman prophesy? Would she prophesy in her home with her husband and children? Well, that doesn't really make any sense, because Paul seems like Paul's talking about a mixed group. It, it, yeah. Would it be out in the streets 
you know, to unbelievers? Well, that doesn't really make any sense because prophesying is mainly for the meeting, which is what he says in chapter 14. He wants prophesying to be uh, understandable in the meeting and, and edifying for everybody. So anyway, it just seems strange that Paul would, in those verses you read, cancel out what he's already put his approbation on. Why would he Why would he say it's okay for women to pray and prophesy in the meeting and then turn around and say uh, several chapters later, uh, it's wrong, it's a shame. So uh, the whole flow of Paul's thought in 11, 12, 13, and 14 is for the, for all sex, both sexes, to be participating. And then mm-hmm. you come to chapter 14, he says, when you come together as a church and you all prophesy, you may all prophesy one by one. And then verse 26, each one of you has a song, a revelation, a tongue, an interpretation, a teaching. So everything from 11 to 1432 or 3 would Im- would imply the participation of both sexes. So why mm-hmm. would you use those two verses you read to cancel out the whole flow of Paul's thought? So to me, that's an insuperable problem for those who yeah. use those two verses to cancel out women participation, because it goes against a whole boatload of what Paul has already <laughs> said. That's just a horrible <laughs> yes. way to use Scripture. You would have... It seems to me a better way to look at it would be, well, okay, here we have a little problem, but we're not going to use these verses just to throw out everything Paul has said in 11, 12, 13, and most of 14. That just doesn't make yeah. any sense. So yeah. what is what does it mean? <clears throat> and it's only been since, you know, 19, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 2003 that I felt like I I received some more light on this because I was wrestling with it for many years. But but it it appears that that those statements there are not Paul uh, speaking. That's not those are not his opinions. But he's giving the opinion of the uh, what we would now call the Talmud, but the rabbinic uh, beliefs and statements. And why would we say that? Because first of all, when it says that uh, the uh, woman should be uh, submissive or whatever, as the law says. Well, what law is that referring to? Because the Old Testament doesn't say that explicitly, the way it's stated there. And so it would make more sense to see that as the rabbinical uh, teaching. And listen to what the rabbis said uh, in the uh, later, uh, when it was codified, became known as the Talmud. Notice what what it says. Quote, a woman's voice is prohibited because it is sexually provocative. Here's another quote. It is a shame for a woman to let her voice be heard among men. Another quote. The voice of a woman is filthy nakedness. Now, uh, that sounds more like the statements you read in 34 and 35. Uh, right. Because why would we think that Paul, in light of all that Paul said in his writings... And, and the book of Acts uh, that Luke said, why would we suppose that Paul would call the speaking of a female a shameful act? That just doesn't make any sense. There's no reason to believe that Paul would view the speaking of a sister as shameful. Now, the word shameful, the, the word shameful that, that is often translated, that's really not strong enough because it means lewd, filthy, wickedness and there was just a very strong word so who, whatever this is saying it's saying that the speaking of a woman is lewd well hmm. we i just read to you that the the rabbis said that but paul right. never wouldn't say that there's no reason to believe paul would ever say anything like that yes so yeah, it's very out of the, character yeah yeah and so then in, in verse 36 when it says what did the word of god originate with you that's what you call in the Greek an adversative, and it gets lost in most English translations. So really yeah, it, right, says, yeah. it says, what? Did the word of God originate with you? In other words, he, uh, Thayer, uh, in his lexicon, uses this verse as an example where Paul disagrees with what was previously just said by saying the adversative, what? And so Paul is, you know, <laughs> in disbelief of what this yeah. is saying. So 
So that's another reason why it would it point to that this is not Paul's opinion, but but people who are more in the Judaistic uh, line of things. And <clears throat> so I think that uh, the word shame is used in First Corinthians 11, where Paul says it's a it's shameful for a woman to pray or prophesy with her head uncovered. So if it was shameful for a woman to pray or prophesy, why didn't Paul say that in First Corinthians 11? He should have said it's shameful for a woman to pray or prophesy, but he didn't. He said it was right. shameful for her to pray or prophesy with her head uncovered, which is another issue. But anyway, yeah. my point is is that the word shameful is a very strong word, and there's no reason under the sun to believe that Paul would ever assert that for female uh, believers to to speak in the assembly is a lewd, filthy uh, action on their part. There, that's to me that is like you said, it's so out of character to to, mm-hmm. to assert that Paul would would say that. There's simply no basis for it, and so that would, all these things lead me to believe that this is a statement of of another opinion, not Paul's uh, view. Because right. and it's, and, you know, and it's, go ahead. Oh, I just gonna, I was going to point out for, for are not aware of this, but um, that what we believe is happening is is that actually um, Paul's letter, which we have in First Corinthians fifty, uh, First Corinthians, uh, is actually a response letter to the one that they sent to him. And right. what he's doing throughout First Corinthians is actually uh, answering their. He's going through their letter and answering their their questions or their problems. Like, oh, hey, you, you know, there's a quarrel. Between this, this you know, some people within the church. Well, then he deals with right. that. Well, then, mm-hmm. hey, they're complaining. Some of, some of them are not eating properly, or they're not behaving properly during the time when we share, uh, you know, the common meal or the love right. feast. Mm-hmm. Then he corrects that. And so as he's going through the letter, he's just going through their their letter to him, which we don't have a copy of. Right. But we under, we 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 get. He mentions that he got letters from them and that he's responding right. to them. So right. That what we in, think is happening in, there in the in the chapter seven, he specifically says. It was reported to me. In other words, he he mentioned something that was specifically uh, stated to him by them. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. And so Mm -hmm. what we think is happening is he's quoting back to them a chunk of what they said to him, which was from the Talmud, we believe, and then those things things you just quoted, which seem very, very almost exact quotes from those Talmudic passages. Right. And and as if someone in that church was saying, and the church in Corinth was saying, hey, look, you know, Paul – uh, you were a good Pharisee, right? You know that you know what the law right. says, right? We're right. not supposed to do mm-hmm. this, right? And then he quotes it back to them, and then has that exclamation of "What?" Now that what I find interesting is I use an NIV, and my NIV doesn't have that exclamation, uh, right. which should be there, right? right? Verse thirty-six. You know this this what? Right. Um, but it is there in the Greek. Right. It's just one letter in the Greek. It's an you know it, it, it's an a. It's, it's it would be pronounced in the Greek a. So it's just mm. a, you know. So in other words, that's the <laughs> that's the adversity, and it it means what, what? Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. So that yeah. anyway, that, there's a lot to go into, but those are the fundamental uh, pointers that would indicate to me that the best solution for this passage is to see it as a quotation of something else, and that Paul doesn't agree with it, and certainly the actual statement itself flies in the face of everything that Paul taught in his writing so you know it just points to the fact that this would resolve the the seeming conflict between those verses and what he said in chapter 11 where he put his approbation on women uh speaking mm-hmm. so you know that i've been wrestling with this for over 20 years and that makes the most sense to me and it it does it doesn't violate the 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 flow it does justice to paul's flow overall flow and all that so Every view is going to have a few um, issues, but it seems to me that that view is the most satisfactory, and it's being honest with the text and, and seems mm-hmm. to do more justice to the total flow and teaching of Paul in all his writings. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I, we mentioned this in the in the previous show last week, but, you know, this whole, just again, being out of out of character with Paul, you know, like when, when Paul says in Galatians 3, you know, when you come together, when when as the body of Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for right. you are all one in Christ Jesus. I mean, he's he's emphasizing to them, and he does it other places as well to say, 
hey, you know, when you come together, those other distinctions don't mean anything anymore. Because right. you are equal mm-hmm. brothers and sisters in Christ, and you love one another. And, and what, like you said, what he unpacks for us in First Corinthians is this beautiful picture of this is the way the body of Christ should operate. And he right. includes men and women, that everyone there in that, in that gathering has mm-hmm. been given a gift of the Holy Spirit, and they are free. There's freedom in Christ. Right. To use that gift. And, and I love also the fact that, you know, you, you mentioned how earlier in Corinthians— uh, Paul talks about, you know, hey, when when women prophesy, they should do it this way. Mm-hmm. And then he goes on later to really to talk about how prophecy, above all, is one of the greatest of all gifts, you know, in the body of Christ. And so right. he's not at all against them from of women from exercising this, what, you know, what Paul would consider one of the greatest gifts uh, that God could give to the body of Christ, and that women are free uh, to speak. But, of course, if they do that, then they're going to be speaking. Um, right. And I also think it's very un- inconsistent, again, uh, it just seems totally out of character for Paul to tell the church in Corinth uh, how to behave when they come together in Christ and to appeal to something in the law. Right. Uh, it just exactly. seems really bizarre. Like, right. why would he do that? <laughs> right. He, and it, exactly. Everything he's trying and, to do is sample to tell, out everything he's been saying. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Like, hey, you're you're not under the law anymore. You're free in Christ, and you right. know, don't go, don't put yourself back under the yoke again, and all this stuff. And then, oh, by the way, the law says do it this way. It just right. doesn't make so, any sense. Yeah. Yeah, so I think the the uh, and as we said last week, again we I think it's good to keep in mind that somehow in all this that Acts two has to have some kind of hermeneutical priority because there you've got on the day of Pentecost men 120 men and women uh, speaking in other languages and then Peter starts right off you know in the age of the Messiah men and women will prophesy. So, I mean, it just starts off like that. So, again, to use Timothy in 1 Corinthians 14 to cancel out the prophesying of women when it was specifically stated on the day of Pentecost at the beginning of the Ecclesia, you know, again, that seems so out of character. You know, somehow Acts 2 has to set the stage for the whole way that men and women are to function uh, in the body of Christ. And, again, it just fits right into what, happened on that wonderful day. I mean, men and women spoke in many languages right there in front of everybody. Amen. Amen. Mm-hmm. And that was the fulfillment of prophecy. It was the beginning of the church. It was the, the pouring out right. of the Holy Spirit upon the body of Christ. And uh, and it, and it was prophesied from a long, long time ago. This is what was God was going to do, uh, you know, when he ushered in this, when the new temple of Christ is going to be built, you know, and, and it's right. us. Right. Uh, and, I, ha- and, I have yeah, to so, say... Yeah. Go ahead. I, well, I have. To, I wanted to just say what, in terms of the application of all this, that you know, it just really grieves my heart as I think back over all the years when I've heard. Uh, I was. We were in a group once in Louisiana on a Sunday morning, and the the guy who was sort of the leader started right off at the beginning of the meeting and said this, in accordance with Paul's instructions in First Corinthians 14, women will be silent during this meeting. And, I mean, it was just like a cloud came over the meeting, and it just felt like the Holy Spirit was grieved and and all that. And that's the thing that troubles me is that how people use these scriptures to silence half the priesthood. And and we are absolutely impoverished if we only hear from half of the image of God. In order to have complete personhood, you need male and female And we should have both the brothers and the sisters participating in Christ to share him with one another. And if we silence the females, what an injustice we're doing to the expression of Jesus in the body of Christ. Yeah, amen. And, you know, I I totally agree with you. And I think especially in uh, organic church and house church circles, I mean, uh, you know, we started – our church family got together a little over six years ago, and, and from the beginning, we just, you know, our policy was men, women, children, young, old, we don't care, you know, we, we mm-hmm. really believed that every every single member of the body of Christ, hey, if you have Christ, you're in, and right. we're we free to speak and share. And God has spoken so many powerful, beautiful, amazing things through the body, through, you know, children, through through little girls and little boys and women. And Amen. Men. Uh, right. and, and to think to think that we would have... How much blessing we would have missed if we had silenced them from the beginning? I just—it's right. really sad. Yeah, very yeah, sad. It's to horrible. Think that. <laughs> yeah. Right. And you know, and John, I, I'm sorry we're running out of time again here, but um, 
uh, I really thank you for coming back to finish up this topic. And I do want to tell everybody, uh, you need to get this book. It's a great book for yourself to read, and you need to share it with others, um, share it with people that you know. It's uh, The book is What's with Paul and Women. It's available on John's website. It, it's his name, just J-O-N-Z-E-N-S, johnzins.com. It's also on Amazon as well, right? Right, amazon.com, yep. And uh, but you know, get it from John directly if you can, and be a blessing to him as well. And John, would you uh, could we come could we talk together again sometime um, next time? We'll, we'll set something up. But I'd love to have you come back and have you and I talk about another topic that's a little controversial, which is about uh, different views of of hell and uh, what happens to us after we die. Right, and yeah, in my book, uh, Christ Minimized: The Response to Rob Bell's Love Wins, then I yeah. go into some of those things, and I'd be glad to talk with you about that. Awesome. Well, let's set, set that up, and uh, we'll be in touch with that. And thank you, everybody, for listening. Uh, it's all we're out of time now for this show, but we'll uh, we'll talk to you again next time. God bless. Okay. Thanks, John. Thanks so much. Right. Bye bye. Right. Bye bye. And thank you for listening to Subversive Radio. Good night. <laughs>